Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay, and we'll be back in a few seconds to talk about what would a, a new, a different, a better society actually look like. I'm, I'm certainly one that's convinced that to fight against the uh, sort of distortion or depravity, as our next guest calls our current system, uh, you also have to have a vision to fight for. And so we're going to be doing that discussion soon with Michael Albert and talk about his new book, No Bosses. Please don't forget, there's a donate button. Uh, we can't do this if you don't hit it once in a while. Uh, subscribe and share and all the buttons. And most importantly, uh, get to our website and sign up for the email list if you're not on it already. Uh, back in a few seconds. In a preface to the book, No Bosses by Michael Albert, Noam Chomsky writes the following. The chapters do not provide a complete blueprint, but rather the essentials, or what Albert calls a scaffold, for future experience to fill out. The scaffold describes and advocates a natural and built commons, workers and consumers self-managing councils, a division of labor that balances empowering tasks among all workers, a norm that apportions income for duration, intensity, and onerousness of socially valued labor. And finally, not markets or central planning, but instead participatory planning by workers and consumers of what is produced, by what means to, to what ends. It makes a compelling case that these features can be brought together in a spirit of solidarity, establish a self-managing, equitable, sustainable, participatory new economy with a rich artistic and intellectual culture as well. Now joining us to talk about this new book, No Bosses, now joining us is Michael Albert. He's a longtime activist, author of 20 books and hundreds of articles, founder and staff at Znet, and for our purposes today, most relevant, the co-author of a vision called Participatory Economics, sometimes Participatory Socialism, and as I said, his new book, No Bosses. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. So, first of all, I have to admit something, which most hosts, I don't think, like to admit, but I'm going to admit it. I haven't read the whole book yet. Um, I've, I've read, I think, significant pieces of it. I get a sense of the argument. Uh, but, but it's really quite an in-depth uh, analysis of what a new, different kind of society could look like. Um, and so we're, we're, we're going to talk about some of the features of it. Um, so be, before I get you to kind of lay out the very broad uh, vision of what the scaffold is, uh, why at this point of history did you decide this was the book you needed to write? I suppose the honest answer is I didn't. That is, um, this vision emerged uh, at the end of the 60s during that period of upheaval. And so the the impetus to talk about vision came then. And uh, I guess the, the easiest way to, to describe how that happened was that Myself and Robin Hennell, who was my partner in developing this vision, um, constantly ran into the question, sort of put this way, we get what you, what you don't like, we understand what you don't like, but what are you for? And oftentimes it felt like the person who was asking that, and sometimes it was true, was basically saying, if you don't have an answer to that question, shut up. You have no right being so critical, um, kind of thing that a parent might say to you, but you could also run into it in uh, organizing, and we did. And uh, our response was basically, you know, you don't have to have a full alternative to slavery in order to be an abolitionist. Um, uh, I don't have to understand everything about what a new economy is going to look like to oppose capitalism. But after a while, we began to feel like that was a justified answer. It was a sort of an accurate true answer, but it was strategically dumb. Because a lot of the people who were asking really meant it. They really meant, okay, yeah, this sucks. This is terrible. But is there anything better? 
what are you, what are you for? And so that kicked off the experience of trying to come up with an economic vision that was viable and worthy. And then the, we come to the present, and it's not the first offering on that, but it's an attempt to, uh, that I hope is more succinct, tightly argued, maybe better, um, over this period of time. So I wrote it now to do something better than in the past. Well, like I said in the intro, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer that one needs a vision to fight for, not just against. Uh, I mean, in the 1930s, uh, in the 40s, uh, even to some extent the 50s, but less so, as it, uh, the Soviet Union was that model for millions and millions of people, and, and rightly or wrongly, and whether they uh, you know, really understood what was going on there, uh, it still, it was a work, uh, the state was at least a worker state. It's, it certainly had uh, full employment and healthcare and actually a very good educational system and, and so on and so on. And it turned out that a lot of the accusations against it uh, as, had, as that had, it had become more or less a kind of centralized police state uh, turned out to be true. Um, a lot of people didn't want to believe it. Uh, but that didn't mean that one, that vision wasn't something to fight for, at least in a broad sense. And then when that vision collapsed, it left a, a real gaping hole in the progressive movement around the world. Uh, that, okay, now we, sort of what you just said, we know what we don't like, but wh what are we actually fighting for? And so I, I think this is a critical question in, in terms of organizing and the movement. Uh, and, and the thing too is, you know, people wonder what's going on with the support for Trump and this kind of right-wing politics, uh, because in some ways it's filling a void. Uh, the, the, the traditional American uh, narrative is espoused either by uh, corporate Democrats or old-style Republicans is, is dis quite discredited, and, and it's not a vision that people will fight for. So I think, I think it's very important to have this debate and discussion. It's one of the things I've always wanted to do with the analysis, and, and I'm glad we're doing it, and I'm going to do a lot more of it. And, and of course, there isn't one vision of what we're going to fight for, but it's, it's sort of in the, in the same ballpark. So give us a sense of what that scaffolding is. Let, let me just say, I'll do that in a second, but let me just say that I agree with you completely about the importance of it, and I'd, I'd even like to add a, a, an element. Um, if you're fighting against something, that's good. If the thing you're fighting against is horrible as it is. Um, but how do you fight? How do you know what to do? How do you know uh, what, what to reveal, what to argue for, what to, how do you plant the seeds of the future in the present? Uh, so that's one reason why uh, vision matters, it's because strategy isn't rooted only at one end in the present. It also has to lead to where you want to go. And the other reason is the reason I think you were driving at, which is, you could almost say psychological, um, but I think it's more than that, uh, which is that absent the positive, we're entirely negative. And that negativity um, has a kind of a tone and an, and a and a dynamic and a culture associated with it, which is very off-putting. And so we don't attract people because they feel like, well, I'm supposed to make sacrifices and struggle and, and reorient myself, and you won't even tell me what for. And they also feel like, well, I'm supposed to do all those things. And the, you know, the sort of vibes that you give off are so negative. Um, and I don't want to do it. And so we don't, we need vision in order to grow um, now, not just because it would be nice to have it down the road when there's something to implement. Okay, so what's the scaffold, you asked? Um, well, first of all, what's the logic of it? It's those things which we can say confidently now are needed, are necessary, if the future, and this is an economy we're talking about in the book No Bosses, other things are also important, 
kinship, the political system, community, culture. But the book is about the economy mostly. Um, what things can we say are needed um, and essential, basically, if this future economy is going to have the attributes we want it to have? Not a full, a full um, uh, blueprint for the reasons Gnomes gives and one more. One, we don't know enough to do a blueprint. We're going to learn all sorts of new things as time passes. You can't blueprint them in advance. So that's that's a point that Noam makes and when he, when he makes this argument. But there's another reason, I think, that I feel, which is it's not our place. It's not our place to tell future citizens the details of how they're going to function. The only thing that it's our place to do is to try to hand them a world in which they can function the way they want to, in which they can manage their own lives, in which they do have equity, in which they do have solidarity, and so on. And so the scaffold is those components of a new society which are essential and without which you're not going to have that. So the most obvious one is the one that has been, you know, pronounced, uh, argued for um, forever, for a long time, which is that you can't have private ownership of the means of production. You can't have capitalists. You can't have 1% who own everything and who therefore administer everything, determine the outcomes for everything. And in place of that, participatory economics says, let's have a commons of productive assets. Um, it really sets aside ownership completely. Uh, it's not capitalists who own it. It's not anybody who owns it. It's this it's this commons of productive assets, and the question then becomes: Well, how do you get to use it? You know, how how does a how does a workplace get to use the resources and the tools and so on? But the idea is a productive commons. Okay, so what you're about to describe the scaffolding is a building that's going to get erected after there's been a transition. We don't know for how long from existing capitalism to we essentially abolition of private ownership to ownership by the commons. So there's quite a transition that's going to have to take place, but that's not what the book's about. The book is about what might this look like once you have had this transition. Am I, am I right in that? Basically, yes. And uh, over on the side here, there's a file called Transition. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, it's the next project. But yes, um, the we now have what we have. We now have what? Private ownership of the means of production. We have what we call a corporate division of labor. That's a division of labor in which about 20% of the workforce does empowering tasks and 80% does disempowering tasks. We have um, remuneration income for property, for bargaining power, and to an extent for output. Uh, and we have markets and or central planning. And we really do have both in the United States. Amazon is centrally planned and Amazon is as big as many economies. So we do have central planning and we do have markets and a combination. And each of those key components annihilate uh, things that I feel, and this is a value question, things that I feel that Robin and I felt at the beginning characterize a good economy would characterize a good economy people controlling their own lives we call it self-management diversity rather than homogenization solidarity people actually being concerned with one another's well-being instead of a rat race in which you get ahead at the expense of somebody else and instead of um, remuneration uh, for power and and property remuneration for how long you work, how hard you work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which you work um, during socially valued labor, and then participatory planning. And those are the, the those are the scaffold things. So the scaffold isn't the whole building. The whole building is even longer in the future. You you know you describe transition, and then a situation where you're creating the new society or you're creating the new economy and other elements of the society also. Okay, the scaffold is really the key components that you have to get so that that thing that you're creating, that whole new society is going to have the attributes you want it to have. And in the case of the economy, it's going to be classless. It's going to be self-managing, et cetera. Well, if it's classless, then 
in terms of Marx Engelism, you're essentially what does communism look like? I mean, that that's basically, I mean, what Marx and Engels envision after this period of socialism where you still have classes and a state and you still have laws and cops and armies, uh, you're envisioning what does it look like after that? Well, yeah, but um, I mean, you just lined up a bunch of things, cops and state and so on. And those are additional discussions. I don't think that uh, a good society doesn't have a political system. Um, and if you don't want to call that a state, because the word state implies, you know, fierce hierarchy, okay. But a political system, I think it does have. Um, and I even think, you know, I don't, it's probably not something good to go off on. But in a good, in a good economy, um, planes would fly, let's say, let's assume that's the case. You wouldn't have random people as pilots. You would have the people who are piloting the plane have to be trained and able to pilot the plane well. Now, there's more that you would have in a good economy. They would be remunerated like everybody else, and they would have a balanced job. They would do disempowering as well as empowering work. But part of what they would do is fly the plane. Okay, and, and you wouldn't say, well, the pilot has a lot of power while flying, which is true, right? The pilot has the lives of 500 people in his hands or her hands. Yeah, I hope, I hope they're not going to have a big discussion about how to fly the plane, whether no, no, no. feet up in the air. Or, uh... No. And, and, so, um, and so you want a good pilot who's capable yeah, of blah, 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 I don't blah, know blah, about blah. participatory But you wouldn't say <laughs> it's – no, the, uh, the participatory part we'll get to. But it's not that, clearly. And it shouldn't be that about policing either. That is to say – the idea that everybody is going to deal with the kinds of violations that occur, we don't assume all of a sudden everybody is Mother Teresa. You know, people are still people. There'll still be drunkenness. There'll still be um, abuse. There'll still be less of everything, but it doesn't disappear. And so if it doesn't disappear, the people, the way that society deals with it has to be skilled. It has to be learned it has to be uh, capable and it has to be under control and so lots of things that exist now for example some there are some people who would say look factories pollute they um are undignified what they do so let's get rid of them okay that's just silly right i think right you're going to have workplaces you're going to have places where people come together and do work what you want to do is make it humane and self-managed and all the other things. So back to the pilot. The pilot in a participatory economy pilots and does it well and is trained and is capable, but also does uh, uh, at other points in time while not piloting other activities, let's say, um, you know, tending to the, the people on the plane going up and down the aisles and, and helping people out, or maybe uh, tending to, uh, you know, cleaning up the airport. I don't know. But a, a mixed, a mixed uh, combination of tasks. Why? Well, one of the key themes of participatory economics is that between labor and capital, there's another class, a coordinator class. People who by virtue of their circumstances in the economy, so in that sense, it's a sort of a Marxist argument, by virtue of their circumstances in the economy, have more empowering work. Their work gives them a degree of knowledge, awareness, confidence, connections to other people, access to decision-making levers, and 80% are the opposite. Their work deadens, exhausts, reduces skills, um, disconnects, um, uh, and, and so you get a situation where the 20% basically become a new ruling class over the 80%. And the solution to that in participatory economics, or part of the solution to that, is that you don't give 20% of the workforce all the empowering work. You instead define jobs, this is the new division of labor, define jobs in such a way that everybody has a mix of responsibilities and tasks which are comparably empowering. So everybody is prepared to participate 
in the workers' council and also in consumers' councils in a self-managing way, rather than 80% being so exhausted and deadened and, and devoid of information about what's going on and lacking confidence that they don't want to participate and after a while don't, and 20% who set the agendas and do the debating and the arguing and make all the decisions and rule. And that's a big, a big, uh, um, that's a piece of participatory economics, which is uh, connected to and motivated by the desire to get rid of not just an owning class on top, but to get rid of a, a class of, of empowered employees on top by having that empowerment spread out. So that's one of the key scaffolding features. The argument is, if you don't do that, if you keep the old corporate division of labor, you're going to, no matter what people's wills is, no matter what people's inclinations and their heartfelt desires are, that's not the issue. The structure will impose a class division and class rule. And so you need to change the corporate division of labor to balance job complexes. Well, to kind of root this in where we are and might be, um, the world you're describing only comes into being if there's, as I said before, a kind of transition from private, primarily privately owned economy to socially owned economy, whatever form that might take. And to some extent, it's a different discussion because you still have classes and you still have probably a mix of public ownership and private ownership. Uh, but to get where you're at, and I don't know if you've, in, in the book, I'm not sure it goes there, but assuming humanity survives our current circumstances of climate threat and nuclear threat and so on, uh, you're, at a, you're at a whole other stage of human society, which at, uh, at this point, aren't you into artificial intelligence and robotics? Like the whole nature of work is going to have changed. Like, I don't know if there are any brain dead menial jobs anymore. Yeah, I, I have to admit I'm not too impressed with that kind of um, formulation. But let's go 20 years into the past, right? Uh, no, so what do you not, mean not impressed with that? For, what, what, what aren't you impressed by? I, I, I am not impressed with, the, uh, with what's attributed to artificial intelligence and what it's going to be able to do. And I'm not impressed with the notion that, you know, there'll be no onerous work. There will be and it will have to be shared. But if there isn't, great. But, but let me go 20 years into the past, because I think what we're talking about here is relevant now, right? And so in Argentina, when there was an economic crisis and uh, uh, tons of factories were taken over by the workforce, but they actually weren't taken over by the workforce per, in, the, in the way we think of it. What happened was the capitalists punted. The capitalists decided this thing is no longer working for me, and they basically left. And the coordinator class inside those workplaces said to themselves, you know, it was already failing. Without the owner, it sure as hell going to fail. I'm going too. So they left also. So you had all these workplaces of diverse kinds um, that were void of their ownership sector and void of their coordinator class sector, but the workers couldn't go anyplace, so they took over. And so that was a remarkable kind of situation. And when the workers took over, interestingly, they formed workers' assemblies or workers' councils, I like to call them, um, uh, and instituted uh, a kind of dem democratic decision-making, voting, not exactly what we call uh, self-management in participatory economics, but uh, effectively a long ways toward it. They also pretty much leveled the wages so they went a long ways toward equitable incomes. They even, in some cases, took into account people's personal circumstances. So they did that too. Um, and I was in a room with about 50 representatives from around Argentina from occupied workplaces. And I've told this story before because, to me, it's so powerful. Um, uh, before the 
before the sort of formal section, I was there to speak. Before the formal section, um, people are just chatting and, you know, talking with each other. And it's very light and upbeat. People from across the country are meeting other people, and they're all members of this small group of people who have taken over factories. But we start, and I say, let's go around the room, and we start doing that with, with a little bit of reporting on your circumstances. And by the time the seventh person, and it was literally the seventh person, is making this brief report, not only has the room no longer upbeat, but it's maudlin, and some people are crying, um, literally have tears in their eyes. And the, the, seven, the seventh person said this, I never would have thought, I could never imagine that I would say, maybe Margaret Thatcher was right. But we took over the workplace, and we instituted democracy, and we uh, uh, made our wages fair, and we began to work. And not only that, we made the workplace succeed. We got it back on track, right? But now all the old crap is coming back. And that's what one through seven said also in various ways. And at that point, I interrupted and I said, when you took over, what did you do about the various jobs? What did you do to, to deal with the fact that the engineers and the finance people and so on and so forth had left? And they said, well, obviously we had to do the jobs. So, so people took responsibility for doing the jobs. And I said, and so you had a new person who was, for example, doing the accounting and the financial officer. And they said, yes. They didn't really understand the question because it seemed like it was the only possible thing you could do. And then I argued, and I think it's the case, that what happened was not what they thought, and they admitted that what they thought was human nature was, was destroying their experiment, that human nature was at fault for bringing back all the alienation and bringing back the hierarchy uh, against their desires. But it tur I argued that, no, that's not what happened. What happened was you maintained the old division of labor. And even though you populated those jobs with working people whose backgrounds were the same as everybody else's backgrounds, nonetheless, over time and not very long, those people filling those jobs by virtue of what they were doing and the responsibility that they saw themselves as having began to see themselves as more worthy, as deserving more. They also came to the meetings with more information and knowledge and confidence. They started doing the agendas and they just kept nodding. And then they said, yeah, that's exactly, I mean, they do, I don't even go to the meeting anymore, one of them said, you know. And, um, and that's, that's an institution at work, right? That's, that's what it means to talk about an institution mattering. This institution, the corporate division of labor, was overthrowing the will of the workplace. They really wanted justice. They really wanted equity. They really wanted their experiment to be different. And all the old crap was coming back. So, okay, so participatory well, economics well, mattered they... right then, right? In other words, how, what would they have done differently? Is that what you can ask? Well, there's first of all, let's parse this out for a second. Okay. The, this kind of workers' ownership, workers' collective in this day and age, uh, it happens. You have a, an enormous one in Spain called Mondragon, and there's smaller experiments. But they're still operating within essentially a capitalist world, and they don't change the nature of that, even though Mondragon in Spain is enormous. It's one of the larger companies, I think, in Spain. Uh, it has not changed the fundamental character of Spanish capitalism. Uh, although that being said, people who work there have a, it's far more democratic for the workers. They're much more careful if, if people, you know, if they have layoffs, they keep paying people and so on. So it's better, but it, it's not where your book is at by any means. Now, that being said, whether it's now or later, how do you deal with this fact that these, they're, like someone's going to have to keep the books, know something about bookkeeping? So what's, what are you going to change about the division of labor? So, so it's true that somebody has to know something about bookkeeping, but it's not true that somebody has to 
do only bookkeeping and somebody else has to do only cleaning the floors. It could be the case that we that we essentially this is what we did at South End Press years and years and years ago. It could be the case that some that that the workforce says, here are our tasks. These tasks all have to get done. That's true. Here's how we're going to divide them up. We're going to divide them up in such a way that each person has a mix of tasks and responsibilities such that their work conveys to them comparable empowerment to the other workers. And you can, you know, look at it in their case or in, say, I mean, a hospital. It means, okay, the surgeon no longer does only surgery. I mean, it, it, it's clear what it means. I mean, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of contrary to our expectations that people should do a mix of things. And some of them are empowering and some of them are not. Some of them are disempowering even. Yeah, but hang on here. A surgeon can go clean floors. I don't think it's a particularly good use of all that years of training. But Let's someone who's been trained to clean floors can't go do surgery. Correct. So so that's your transition, right? So the first, and I want to address both those things. Is it is it a good use of the surgeon's time to do something other than surgery? If you look at just the surgeon and you look at just the, the patients of that one surgeon, the answer is no. It's idiotic, right? I agree with you. But if you look at the whole economic system, no, it is a good use of time. Why? Because the surgeon, and that is to say everybody who does empowered work, also doing disempowering work, means that the 80% of the population whose upbringing, circumstances, schooling, and situation at work denies their capacity to do anything empowering and thus gets no empowering work out of them, right, is, is undone. And we unleash the capabilities of those the people. The society you're talking about, anyone with the skill and inclination to go to medical school can go. I mean, you're not going to have the barriers to medical school we have now. Yeah, but you're, what you're not going to have is you, you, you go to medical school and you become a doctor, but you're not being just a doctor. You're also being a nurse or a custodian or whatever. You're doing a mix of things. And you say to yourself, um, or uh, I'll let you off the hook for being the, <laughs> the, fo the foil here. Margaret Thatcher would say, um, Michael, you're crazy. The, the, the doctor is doing, let's say the surgeon is doing 40 hours of surgery. And you're telling me it makes sense to have a situation in which that talented individual, instead of doing 40 hours of surgery, does, let's make it simple, 20 hours and does 20 hours of, you know, nursing and cleaning and whatever else. And I say back, yes. And she says to me, but we lose half of our surgery. And I say back, yeah, you'd be right if the reason why the people who aren't doing empowering work aren't doing it because they are genetically incapable of doing it, which is what you think, Margaret. But that's not the case. And to make this argument in front of, say, an, an audience speaking or something, I say, you know, think back 50 years. Put all the surgeons in a stadium. That's a big stadium. Put all the surgeons in a stadium and look around. What do you see? And right away, somebody says, well, they're almost all white men. I say, yeah. And why do the why do those surgeons say that they are in the stadium and the rest of us aren't, right? The women aren't in particular and the blacks aren't and Latinos aren't. What do they give as their answer? They say it's because we're good at it and they're not. We're, we're capable of it and they're not. And uh, of course, that was nonsense. It's nonsense now that the coordinator class is good at empowering tasks and capable of empowering tasks and the working class isn't. The working class is is downtrodden and prevented in the same way that women and blacks were of different dynamics, but to the same degree as women and blacks were before. Let me just say one mixing, last story. I think you're mixing up time periods here. Well, you I got, certainly am. I'm comparing now and then. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. But in, in imagining this future, uh, you would be, if you're, 
it would be more like if you're talking, let's stay within hospitals and, and doctors, it'd be more like what the Cubans have done, where you have way more doctors and way more accessibility to medical school. Sure. And in fact, being a doctor is practically an ordinary job because you, you know, it's, it's so easy and maybe to, it to is. get maybe. medical education. Maybe it is. So you don't it, need to is. tell those doctors to go wash some floors. You well, open up the doors of the medical school so anyone that has the inclination and ability becomes a doctor. Now, it that, doesn't have no, to be the special no, privilege. No, that last yeah. step there, that last step there was if everybody, not everybody has a capacity. I couldn't be a doctor, okay? Not Nor everybody could can I, be a doctor. Nor could I, I want. I okay. don't want to be a doctor. Okay. Nor but could I. I'm if, terrible at but math and whatever. But, <laughs> but there's 80% of the population that's not doing empowering work. And there's 20% that is. If, if it's the case, as I think it is, that in the 80%, the the, I don't know what to call it, the spectrum, the spread, the distribution of capacities is marginally different from the distribution of capacities in the, in the 20%, then if you open the doors to them doing only, doing the empowering tasks they're capable of, there is nobody available to do disempowering work. Well, let's, let's, we don't have too much time in this segment. We are going to do more segments because we're going to keep talking and, and even increasingly fighting, I hope. Um, what, what do you mean by empowering work? What does that mean? Well, uh, it means... Like I used to tests. work on the railroad, okay? I worked on the railroad for five years. Right. I fixed freight cars. Is that empowering work, fixing a freight I, car? I, I, I don't know. Here's the answer, though. Because I love, I love doing it, but I just, I right. don't know what's empowering about it. Well, here's it the was, answer. I'll I tell think. you one thing it was. It was, uh, you know, because we had a union and because we fought for our rights. It was it better was than if you didn't. It was, di right. it was dignified because we made it so. Okay. If, if, we, if we have a workplace and we have a whole lot of tasks that have to get done, right? The empowering tasks are the ones that convey to the person doing it attributes which are uh, which contribute to being able to express their will and their desire, argue for it, participate, and have the inclination to do so. The disempowering tasks have the opposite implications for the people doing it. So the in the Argentine example I gave you, um, the the subset of the workforce and the workers with the same backgrounds, right? The subset of the workforce doing those empowering tasks became elevated. It began to dominate the meetings. It set the agendas. It was the one doing the talking. And the disempowered workers were the ones who basically had to choose among them who they would support or something. It sounds a little like U.S. elections. And then would stop doing it and, and, um, uh, and would back off, and then the empowered workers would start paying themselves more. Coordinator class consciousness and working class consciousness is maybe important to talk about. But you, you, you brought up one other thing that I just want to address for a second, because a lot of people might feel like, come on, Michael, um, you're really, I mean, you're saying here that everybody can do a set of empowering tasks sufficient to, to you know, to have a, a, an overall balanced job. Isn't that a big assumption? And back to Argentina, I'm talking to a woman in a glass factory. And she was, remember, they, they, they kept the old division of labor. She was now essentially the chief financial officer. She was doing the accounting. She was keeping the books. So I asked her what she had been doing before. And she had been, um, 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 I was going to use the word manning, but it doesn't sound its wrong. Uh, she had been functioning at this um, furnace, this glass furnace, and she showed it to me. I would have lasted, you know, maybe one day, probably two hours. Incredible heat, just ridiculous, doing the same motions over and over again. And then they, the, the owner left, the accountants left, the engineers left, and she became the accountant. Um, how did, how did you do that? I asked. I, I mean, what was the hardest thing to learn? And I really, 
it was your question in a very narrow time frame and in a very precise case. I said, what was the hardest thing to learn? She didn't want to tell me. She didn't want to talk about that. So I said, um, well, was it learning accounting concepts? No. Was it learning how to use the computer? No. Was it learning how to use a spreadsheet? No. Well, was it learning how to present the case? No. So I said, well, you know, please, I, I, I really, please tell me. So she said, first, I had to learn to read. So this person went from being a working class person doing the same rote movements over and over in front of a furnace, which was probably taking years off her life, to being the person who was doing the accounting and the books and reporting on it in a period of a few months, right? And had to learn to read on the way. Now, I admit it was it was much for me to believe, but it was there, right? The capacity of people is a lot greater than we let on. You and I couldn't be a doctor or a surgeon for a lot of reasons, not wanting to, probably not having the dexterity, not having the, whatever, right? But everybody can do empowering tasks. Everybody can do empowering tasks. The number of, well, maybe of people gonna, who we'll work on assembly board. lines. But, but I okay. think you're putting too much onus, too much emphasis on the job as opposed to the relationship to power in the well, enterprise. That's just because like it's what example, we're talking about. Well, no, maybe you are, but I wouldn't. I'm saying that you could be the person in charge of picking up garbage cans, but you could also be a member of the management committee. At the same time, you could be a it's, member of the HR committee. You it, could so, be, but that's a balanced you job have, complex. That's why. If if that's a in other words, what participatory economics is saying is that it's not a Joe, I don't have to be a part time accountant. I need to be on a on a decision making body that has power, fine, and I can then, still have fine. my job picking up garbage cans. Yeah, fine, absolutely. Just like the doctor can be a surgeon and pick up garbage cans. Agreed. No, so no, the, no, no, no. I'm not saying that. The surgeon should be not a surgeon, a but the cleaner should also be on the management committee, not just picking up garbage cans. I'd, I'd frankly be quite happy if the surgeon just kept doing surgery. Yeah, but... You, yeah, like when I worked the, on the railroad, when uh, I yeah, worked well, most, on the railroad... Most of the nurses wouldn't be happy. Did, not, did you notice are, that in the, the, in the strikes that are going on... And the strikes that are going on right now in the hospitals, right? One of the yeah, most notable not, things not, is the doctors... Because the, the, the they're doctors, not collectively owned. The power starts from the ownership and then the structure of how that ownership is managed, okay, so how our, that power right. is executed. This is our, this is our dispute. Not okay? the nature of the job description. This is, this is our dispute. Our dispute seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong, on the one hand, power flows from ownership, uh, explicit control, etc., which is true in existing firms. Uh, it's not true in, say, uh, Soviet uh, factories under the, the prior system. There was no owner. So it didn't flow from ownership. It flowed from something else. I'm saying it flowed from a distribution of circumstances. And I, I don't want to... We're talking about this entirely. There's also the allocation system to talk about. And there's also the fact that you know, there is no ownership anymore. And there's also the self-managed decision-making procedures by the council inside the workplace. Okay. But all I'm saying is, is that all that can be subverted by private ownership. You're saying that, and I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying it can additionally be subverted by a distribution of tasks, a division of labor, right, which causes some people to be in a position to make decisions, inclined to make decisions, and having the information to make decisions, and other people not. And you're saying back to me, okay, wait a second. If somebody is doing some rote task and repetitive task and picking up garbage, whatever it is, right? Um, they could be on the on the decision making um, board or whatever you had a name for it. I forget what you called it. Um, Say I'm for a management committee, a leadership okay. committee, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So they could be on the leadership committee. All right. So here's the problem with that, I think. 
on the one hand, you're saying the same thing as me. If the person has a mix of responsibilities that cause them to be prepared to participate and make good decisions and make them well, or at least to to participate in making good decisions, they're not Stalin, to participate and make good decisions well, then that's a balanced job complex. But what you're describing, I don't think does that. First of all, it has this management committee, which apparently has a lot of power over everybody else. But second of all, it has somebody who is doing this rote stuff all the time, then making decisions about the workplace. They have to have information about the whole workplace. They have to have the confidence to access that information, et cetera, et cetera. If you just take somebody and you, you, you know, you, you, you invite them to a, a meeting at which there's 14 lawyers and 14 engineers and accountants and so on, and then there's somebody sitting there who spends all day doing stuff that gives them no particular knowledge relevant to the decision making, and you say, okay, you can attend, it, it does nothing, Right. It well, does something. Actually, actually, I don't agree with that. Okay, this we're getting long here now because sh you should watch these interviews I did with Jane McAlevey on how she does bargaining now, not in the future, where when she meets with the uh, employer uh, and she's uh, either advising or in the leadership of, of the negotiations on behalf of the union, she invites the entire workplace. and, and Which so you is get fine. The, I would too. Right? And, 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 I, I would and, too. And, but but in the end, there are representatives that get elected and they do choose who's going to speak. You know, there is going to be a certain level of practicality where you need some kind of decision making that isn't going to involve everybody. There'll be but all that. that. Isn't well, wait a minute. What do you mean decision making isn't going to involve everybody? Well, let's, let's say you say want to, should we hire so-and-so? You're not going to have a, a factory of 5,000 people where 5,000 no. people meet to decide if they're exactly going to hire right. somebody. Exactly right. And who... Who, who would hire? The people who are most affected would be the ones who would be most involved in that decision. For instance, we're hiring to be on a team that you and I are on. Well, then you and I are going to have a lot of say because we don't like that guy. The team's going to pot. So, so yeah, the of course, people who but are you most also affected, have to have an overview of the entire enterprise. So you're going to have to have an elected body and maybe everybody that has an have overview a, of the whole enterprise. Maybe everybody should have a significant overview of the whole enterprise. Let's say we're going to have a decision about the hours of work, right? What time work starts, what time it ends, how the, how the, how the workplace, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Some decisions are affect overwhelmingly just everybody, right? Those are the kinds of decisions that everybody is involved in. Those are big policies. Okay. And then there are decisions that affect a relatively small, this is self-management. There are decisions that are affect overwhelmingly a smaller group subject to those prior decisions, right? So that, so they're, they're working within those globally made decisions and they're making decisions that affect themselves much more. And so they do that. That's fine. Um, but the point okay, is... Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Let's Before we get put it more off. granular okay. about <laughs> this, because uh, we're it's, it's a little bit of one foot in today and one foot in tomorrow here. That's part of the argument here. Uh, we're we're going to do another segment about this because we are going to have a fight about how you have a modern economy without some kind of planning. And and I know you're saying you don't need... It's called participatory planning. planning. Absolutely, well, you do need planning. Okay, well, let's Part find out in the next segment what, what that's going to look like. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, write in, send us your questions and comments, uh, pick up Michael's book. It's called No Bosses. Uh, and uh, where do they get your book? I, as far as I'm aware, I'm, I'm so isolated, you know, COVID. It's in stores and it's online, you know, Amazon, all the various online uh purchase places it's available everywhere okay or so i'm okay, told great um, okay <laughs> all right, all right i know what you're going to do wait let me point them to one thing there's a site called nobossesbook.com and all the reviews are there uh that have come out so far the book's only been out a couple of months two months basically exactly but there's i think about 15 16 reviews there there are a lot of interviews there's there's all sorts of stuff there so 
people could look there get a feeling for well do i really want to read this book or not and then if you do you get it and if you don't you don't okay cool all right thanks michael and thank you for joining us on the analysis.news